Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. Thank you very much for tuning into this podcast, and I appreciate your interest in Texas history. Uh, we are getting back in the groove down here at World Headquarters of Wise About Texas after Hurricane Harvey and uh, Irma hit Florida right after that. And we had Jose out in the Atlantic, and we had Hurricane Maria making a few moves. And uh, it's been a very, very active hurricane season. Our prayers, of course, go out to the people in the islands, and Puerto Rico has just been devastated. So we need to all do what we can to help out there because, uh, as I mentioned in the Hurricane Harvey bonus episode last week, uh, that's what Texans do. We need to uh, offer our special prayers and help for the folks down in the Rockport area, the mid-coast, Port Aransas. They're still suffering a lot, uh, a lot of destruction down there. Uh, I've gotten some more pictures from listeners, and uh, we need to do what we can to help those folks out. Uh, I did read a funny article uh, quoting some of the Port Aransas residents that uh, that they prided themselves on being a little uh, a little different and uh, that they were going to come back uh, as quirky as ever. So uh, shout out to Port Aransas. We know that you'll make it. I want to thank you also for being one of the over 127,000 listeners of this podcast. Uh, we're up to 67 countries around the world and getting a lot of great feedback from listeners. I, I had a great email recently from Anthony in New Jersey who uh, homeschools the kids up there in New Jersey and is using Wise About Texas to teach a little bit about uh, the westward expansion and and the his kids have gotten really into the Texas Revolution because of the podcast so hopefully I'm going to be able to FaceTime with Anthony's kids and do a little special class on Texas history and I, I love doing that kind of thing we can always scrape out a little time to do that so if you've got a particular interest a group that needs a speaker uh, either live or or um, via telecast, let me know. That's always a lot of fun. I love talking about Texas history, folks. Um, well, we're getting back in the production groove, hopefully, here at Wise About Texas. And today, uh, we're going to go a little bit further back, pre-Revolution Texas. I'm going to tell you a little in- interesting story uh, that involves uh, early settlement uh, west of the Colorado, uh, the Comanche Indians, and some ghost stories. So, Let's go back to about 1830, thereabouts, and get wise about Texas. Well, first I want to talk about the hero of our story. He's a man named Josiah Pugh Wilbarger. Josiah Wilbarger was born in 1801. He was actually born on September 10th. This podcast is going to be released a little bit after his birthday on September the 24th or 5th. And uh, he was, there are a couple of different um, sources that uh, some say he was born in Bourbon County, Kentucky. Uh, Some say he was born in Rockingham County, Virginia. I've done a little genealogy. It's hard to determine uh, whether he was born in Virginia, but he definitely was in Kentucky in 1818. Um, In 1823, uh, Josiah moved to Pike County, Missouri. And he got married while he was there. He married a lady named Margaret Baker. And they were married about 1827. And right after the wedding, uh, they moved down to Texas and they arrived at Matagorda in December of 1827. Now that was, he would have been one of the earliest uh, settlers in the area. And remember during that time, uh, Moses Austin, who was in Missouri and looking to colonize Texas, Uh, would have had a lot of folks uh, from Missouri wanting to come to Texas. And Josiah just sort of jumped the gun and got down here uh, pretty early. He was a surveyor. He also taught school at Matagorda. Um, He lived in Matagorda for about a year, and then the sources indicate he moved to LaGrange uh, on the Colorado River um, on a head right that he got in Austin's colony. And he moved... Uh, his his league of land, which was granted in 1832, was above um, Bastrop on the Colorado River. So um, I want to talk about this for a second. When we talk about the Texas Revolution, if you'll recall the stories about Sam Houston moving from Gonzales eastward with the army, which some called a strategic countermarch, some called a retreat. We went over that in a couple of different episodes on the revolution. 
and I'm sure we'll talk about it again. But many, many, many of the settlers thought that Houston would fight Santa Ana on the Colorado. And the reason they thought that was that the Colorado was the effective boundary of the settlement in Texas in 1836. The land west of the Colorado was largely unsettled. And when I say settled, I mean uh, with towns and, and going concerns in farming and ranching and communities built and such because... Um, you had the two roads, the lower road and the upper road, the upper road going to Behar or San Antonio, which was west of the Colorado. But, but off that road, uh, you had the Comanche Indians and settlement was sparse because it was so very dangerous to settle in that area. Well, the further north up the river you went, the worse that problem became. And when you were in the area of Bastrop or Austin Uh, that part of the Colorado River, you were really in danger from the Comanches. And then we don't even talk about any area northwest of there. It was so very dangerous. Um, So for Wilbarger to settle uh, on a league of land in 1832 above Bastrop, in other words, up the Colorado from Bastrop, more toward Austin, uh, he was pretty brave. Um, I mentioned he was a school teacher in Matagorda and he was also a surveyor. So he was doing a lot of surveying for Austin and his colony, which made sense, of course, being from Missouri. Let me mention one more thing I found when Josiah Wilbarger settled on his legal land, uh, he had a couple of travelers and probably helpers with his survey uh, living with him. He built a small house with his wife. Here is his nearest neighbor was said to be 75 miles away down the river. So I don't know if that's exactly accurate or not. Uh, There's no way to really know. But he was a long way beyond what would have been any reasonable frontier at the time. So Josiah was living uh, in the Comancheria all alone, essentially. About 1832, another settler arrived uh, near Wilbarger, named Reuben Hornsby, excuse me, H-O-R-N-S-B-Y, Reuben Hornsby. He had been living in Bastrop, getting ready to occupy his legal land. His league, his grant was on the east bank of the Colorado River. And uh, the easiest way to picture where it was, it was about nine miles uh, down the river from Austin, Texas. And so Hornsby settled and Wilbarger had, uh, I won't say a nearby neighbor, but at least approximate neighbor. So fast forward to 1833. It's summertime, it's August, and uh, Hornsby had uh, a man living with him named Christian. Uh, Hornsby and Wilbarger's place both would have been stopping points for people traveling to see the countryside and and perhaps pick out some land. Um, There were two men, one named Haney and one named Standifer, and they had come from Missouri uh, so they would have known of Wilbarger, and uh, they came down to look around at Texas and, and perhaps uh, organize some settlement there, and that would have been a very common thing. Uh, even Andrew Jackson sent Sam Houston down to look at Texas, uh, as you'll recall, and so people would have traveled down here. Uh, settlers often came in large family groups, and so they would have sent an able-bodied young man, uh, perhaps in the company of another family's able-bodied young man to come down and check out the land and just kind of see if it was worth uh, settling on and report back. And during this time, uh, Austin was trying to raise his colonists and grow his colonies. And so that would have been a very normal thing to do. And of course, you would have found your fellow Missourian, Josiah Wilbarger. So one day in early August, 1833, uh, Wilbarger and Hornsby agree to take these guys out to look at some of this land. So off road Wilbarger, Hornsby, Christian, Standifer, and Haney, and a man named Strether. And they started uh, riding northwest um, from Hornsby's. Now, they would have been riding uh, straight out into Comanche territory. There was no They would have been riding through what is now the city of Austin. Uh, Of course, there was nothing there at the time. And uh, so they probably would have stayed close to the Colorado River. Uh, 
Uh, so out they rode to look at the country. So our story begins as they ride up Walnut Creek. Now, those of you familiar with Austin, uh, if you were to uh, position yourself east of Austin, east of 130, the toll road, uh, there is a Walnut Creek that runs in that area between um, sort of the 183 and 969, which I believe becomes Martin Luther King Boulevard in Austin, uh, sort of that area. There's Walnut Creek, but the accounts, the early accounts talk about it being northwest of where the city now stands. So that's either a different Walnut Creek or perhaps it, it tapers off and picks up. In any event, they're riding on Walnut Creek and they see a lone Indian. Now, it wouldn't have been impossible for them to see a lone Comanche, but as is always the case, it seems, the Comanches knew that the uh, whites were there before the whites, well before the whites knew the Comanches were there. And often the whites never knew the Comanches were there until they were attacked. Uh, but they saw a lone Indian, and that could mean uh, that it was a lone Indian, or it could and more likely mean uh, that he was a scout of some sort, um, either intending to lure them toward him or to go back and report to the band uh, on the activities of the settlers. So... They see a lone Indian, and they take off and, and start chasing him. Well, the Indian gets away, and uh, the accounts say that he got away about the head of Walnut Creek. It also talks about him running into the mountains, so this would have been uh, certainly west of Austin as the country becomes more hilly, and they could never catch him. So they stopped to rest. Well, first they returned uh, to where they had started the adventure, um, and there they stopped to rest. So they're now back east of Austin. Now those of you familiar with Austin traffic would know that none of this could have occurred uh, without committing most of a day toward driving around. But remember back at this time, uh, the, they would have been running straight lines uh, north and south and east and west and there was no I-35 and there was no traffic and uh, so they would have covered these distances very quickly. So they returned to an area east of Austin and they stopped to rest. And this is an important little fact. Some of them hobbled their horses and some of them didn't. Will Barger and Christian and Struther hobbled their horses and they unsaddled their horses. Uh, Haney and Standifer left their horses saddled and just staked them out to graze. Now that, um, back at that time, it would have been very risky to unsaddle your horse and have no way to escape. Um, not clear why they did that. Probably thought that they had chased off uh, the lone Indian. Probably thought it was a lone Indian. And that they were okay because they had covered several miles going back the opposite direction. Well, as they sat there resting, all hell broke loose. And they began to be fired on by an entire group of Indians that they never even knew were there. The Indians had left their horses, had sneaked up on them, and caught them unawares. There were a few scraggly trees around, and each man tried to take cover and fire back at the Indians to very little effect. It was poor cover, and they were in a bad situation. Christian was hit in the leg. Uh, Struther was killed. Wilbarger ran over to Christian, dragged him up against a tree. Uh, Christian had been trying to load his gun. He hadn't primed it, so Wilbarger primed it for him and ran back to his own tree. In the middle of doing all this, Will Barger had caught an arrow in his lower leg and he had a wound in his hip. So an arrow must have grazed him in his hip or maybe a ball from one of the guns the Comanches had. You know, you read a lot of Old West history and it talks about the Comanches or it talks about the Indians in general not getting guns until later, but that's not true. The Comanches had traded horses for years uh, with people in, the, in Louisiana, so uh, not the state of, but the, the territory of Louisiana. And so they would have had guns at this time. Will Barger got to his own tree, and he caught another arrow in the other leg. Now about this time, Struther and Christian noticed that things were not going well, and they had their horses saddled, as I mentioned, so they jumped on their horses and took off. Will Barger saw they were about to leave him, so he started screaming at them, and, and despite having two arrows in his legs, started running after him to try to get on behind one of them and ride off with him. While he was running to chase him, trying to catch him, an Indian shot him in the back of the neck. Now, the ball entered his neck, 
right by his spine and went out through his chin. At least that's what the accounts said. And it stunned him. It paralyzed him. It did not kill him, but it absolutely paralyzed him. He wasn't able to move. He wasn't able to speak, but he was conscious. So any of y'all out there that are physicians can probably email me exactly what probably happened um, with this incident. But suffice to say, uh, he took a serious wound but remained conscious. Well, in all the hubbub, the Indians overtook him. They got Struther and Christian off their horses and cut their throats, killed them right away. They came to Wilbarger and must have thought he was already dead. Uh, so in the Comanche tradition, they began to scalp him. Now, if you get a little queasy, you might want to fast forward about 30 seconds. But what they would have done was grab his hair, cut around his scalp from ear to ear around the top of his head, and would have ripped it off his head. Now, remember, Wilbarger couldn't talk. He couldn't move, but he was conscious. And he knew what they were doing to him. And he described it later as when they ripped the scalp off his head. He described it as the sound of distant thunder. At some point, from either the pain or the loss of blood, Wilbarger would have passed out. He came to later in the evening. He was bleeding, although the bleeding had slowed. He was obviously very seriously wounded. And... Uh, he had lost a ton of blood. They had taken all his clothes, so he was alone. He was naked. He was bleeding. He was scalped. But he was alive. He dragged himself to a pond and just laid down in the pond for a while. Uh, he became chilled, so he dragged himself back up on the bank. He kept going back to this pond to drink the water. He found snails in the grass to eat, but he was in a desperate situation. He could feel and hear the flies in his wounds, which actually probably helped him with the infection or the potential for infection, gross as the, it may seem. He dragged himself to a tree, sat up against it, and one can only presume that he prepared himself to die. And that's where it got interesting. As Josiah sat there under, under the tree, up against the tree, Josiah had a vision. He saw his sister. He had a sister named Margaret Clifton. She lived in uh, Florissant, Missouri, and he, you would think it would be a hallucination when you think about the state he was in, but he distinctly saw the figure of his sister walking toward him, and she spoke to him, and she said, Josiah, you're too weak to go on by yourself, uh, but it's okay. Your friends are going to come take care of you uh, before the sun sets today. And then she walked off in the direction of Hornsby's house. And uh, Wilbarger said that he was calling after her, and who knows if he was actually making a sound or not, but he was trying to call after her, uh, begging her to wait with him. Well, I mentioned earlier that um, Christian and Struthers' throats had been cut by the Indians. Those were the ones that had been wounded uh, during the battle. Struther. Uh, already dead, Christian dead or dying. Haney and Standifer, the uh, and I might have I might have misspoke earlier. Uh, Haney and Standifer got on their horses and took off. Um, and so uh, Haney and Standifer made it to Hornsby's house, and they related what happened with the battle. Haney and Standifer had claimed that there were fifty Indians around Christian Struther and Wilbarger, and they were certain they were dead. And that was the report they made when they got to Reuben Hornsby's. That night, someone else had a vision, and it was Mrs. Hornsby. She woke up in the middle of the night, sat bolt upright, woke up Reuben Hornsby, and said, I just had a dream that I saw Josiah Wilbarger. He's wounded, he's naked, but he's alive. Now, I don't know what Mr. Hornsby must have told her, but she went back to sleep for a little while. Again, same night, sits bolt upright, says, Reuben, I've seen it again. I've seen Josiah Wilbarger. He's naked. He's up against a tree. He's severely wounded, but he's alive. She gets up. She makes coffee, makes breakfast, and pleads with the men to go find Wilbarger. She even told him almost exactly where he would be based on what she had seen in her dream. So the men finally agree, and several of them set out 
to the scene of the fight. Well, they rode to the area where Mrs. Hornsby sent him, and of course, they found Will Barger. He was covered in blood. In fact, they thought he was an Indian at first, and, and he managed to speak, and he said, don't shoot. I'm Will Barger. The only thing Will Barger had left after the fight was one sock. He had taken the sock off his foot, and he had placed it over his skull, where they, the Indians had taken his scalp. Um, they got Will Barger. They took him back to Hornsby's. They treated his scalp wound, and uh, what they did was put bear oil on it. That would have been the treatment back then. And Josiah Wilbarger survived. Now, the scalp wound never fully healed. His skull was exposed the rest of his life. And so, of course, Josiah always wore a hat. Now, with the exposed bone, and again, a call to the physicians out there to email me and tell me exactly how this occurred, but the accounts say that the bone uh, became diseased and eventually started to flake away, which exposed his brain. Uh, but he was still alive, and he was still fully functioning. Well, Josiah lived for 11 more years, and he died due to a very unfortunate accident, which would not have been a problem for anyone but him. He was walking into his gin house one day, and he did nothing more than bump his head on the door. Uh, but given his condition, uh, that was enough, and uh, he never recovered from that accident and uh, died from that scalp wound. The story of Mrs. Hornsby's vision was told for the rest of her life by her and by the men who had heard her and how perfect the vision was and how sincere and earnest she was and how the men had found Josiah exactly where Mrs. Hornsby said they would. But what about Josiah's vision? The vision of his sister, Margaret Clifton, from Florissant, Missouri, that Josiah saw as he sat under that tree as his sister walked up to him and said, Josiah, it'll be okay. Your friends are coming. Well, what nobody knew and nobody could have known because Margaret lived several hundred miles from that oak tree near Austin, Texas, was that on the day Josiah Wilbarger saw his sister Margaret and received her reassurance that he was going to live, his sister Margaret had died the day before in Missouri. So Josiah had a vision of his dead sister reassuring him at the same time that Margaret Hornsby had a dream that Josiah was alive. So Josiah's vision must remain, as his brother later wrote, a marvel and a mystery. Well, now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you how to find some of the locations that I talked about in the episode, and we're going to start with Wilbarger's Bend. Wilbarger's Bend is on Wilbarger Creek, uh, which was where Josiah settled. Uh, the creek runs from about Pflugerville, outside of Austin, uh, to the Colorado River, and it enters the Colorado River near the town of Utley, Texas. Uh, Utley is about six or seven miles north of Bastrop. Uh, the descendants of Josiah Wilbarger back in 1926 uh, put a marker uh, at the intersection of FM Farm Road 969 and Wilbarger Trace Road about one mile east of Utley. So look up Utley on your map and uh, find 969 and Wilbarger Trace Road and uh, you will find uh, the area will, where Wilbarger had settled. As far as the exact site of where Josiah Wilbarger was scalped, I'm going to send you to a historical marker for the old Pecan Springs School. The scalping occurred near Pecan Springs, and there was an old school, a community developed in the area, and there was a school, and there's a marker at 5020 Manor Road, M-A-N-O-R, in Austin, and uh, that marker commemorates the Pecan Springs School. So if you go there, you will be near, fairly near, the area where this scalping incident and Josiah's vision took place. Now, if you'll plug into your uh, GPS 10708 FM 969, that'll take you to a road that leads to the Hornsby Cemetery, and you'll be in the area of Reuben Hornsby's house where Wilbarger had recovered uh, 
from his scalping. So those are a few of the places you can go see in connection with Josiah's vision. Well, that wraps it up for this episode about of Wise About Texas. I sure do appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you'd like to support the promotion and preservation of Texas history, head over to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and plug in Wise About Texas. You can sponsor the show. And uh, check us out on Facebook. We've got the Wise About Texas Facebook page, Twitter, at Wise About Texas. Same with Instagram. Please keep the feedback coming. Leave a review on iTunes if you get a minute. That helps people find more Texas history. I appreciate you listening. Until next time, go out and do something for Texas today. And God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.